Just.com is my third chess business, which is totally absurd to say. This is Eric Alabast, co-founder and CEO of Chess.com. He started the business in 2005. Now it does over $100 million per year in revenue. And the most impressive part, they did not raise a single dollar in venture. As a result of not raising money, did you do things differently? I mean, I had to do it differently. Everything I saw going on in Silicon Valley was like spend, spend, spend. We did the opposite. We thought about monetizing immediately. Everybody was remote. There was no office. I think raising money feels a lot like earning money. It's a self-validation. In the earlier years, was that needle moving moment? There were a couple of moments that things took off. So one was Eric, I am so excited for this. Dude, I've got to hand it to you. You have the best headshot that I've ever seen. And we're going to we're gonna put it on social because everyone does the, you know, like serious looking into the distance and you just smashed it. So thank you for being here, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, I try not to take myself very seriously. I love I love dressing up in different costumes and being weird. So uh, thanks for thanks for using it. No, listen, dude, it kind of goes straight to our first point, though, which is, you know, you love doing things that are slightly out there. I heard that your first entrepreneurial activity happened at nine. What was it? I, that's, that's at a young age. Yeah, I was always like scrappy and I don't know, like my dad was the same way. He was always starting stuff, doing things. Yeah, I did several things at a young age. I would sell things at school. We would sell like, you know, either candy bars or bracelets or things. I would uh, go to where the high school kids would drink beer and leave all their cans and I would collect them all and go recycle them. I would go door to door to sell stationery. I was just always hustling for something, some way to kind Kind of like you know make money and like do something so yeah it's in like the blood i have this theory that exceptional people show exceptionalism early in terms of entrepreneurial activity <laughs> do you agree with that in terms of the best entrepreneurs show entrepreneurialism early i'm just intrigued I mean, you probably have a, you probably look at a wider sample size than I do. I, I look at myself and, you know, obviously I did start young um, and several of the other people I know have as well, but there's also some great, you know, later in life entrepreneurs who kind of did something and then they had like a, a moment and a spark. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a fair thesis. No, no, you're clearly not a venture investor because if you were, we ignore the data set that disproves <laughs> our theory. So yeah, there's still some training for you to do, Eric. Um, yeah. Luckily, luckily, you're actually building value. I heard uh, you say before that you're generally unemployable. Um, why do you think that and what makes you unemployable? You know, it's it's kind of funny. I have like this thing inside of me that if it's like, if it's my mission of th something I want to do, I am a hundred percent in, I am 200% in. If it's somebody else's thing they want, it just doesn't motivate me. And it's, this is my dad. And now my 15 year old son is exactly the same. If he wants to do it, He's thousand. He just can't be stopped. But if it's something someone else wants him to do, he cannot be motivated. And so I don't know what it is, man. I don't know what the gene is. Maybe one day we'll know. But, um, you know, and it's not like I'm a non-compliant or disobedient person. But like with my heart's not in it, I can't get there. Um, but if my heart is, nothing can stop me. You said that your father was the same. Having watched him then operate, were there any takeaways for you? And did that impact your mindset? I think my dad, he ended up doing something he loved, which was serving people in the legal community, but he really doesn't love being a lawyer. So he kind of like tried a lot of different things. And unfortunately for him, they didn't really pan out. And so he kind of always fell back. And, you know, he came from like a very poor immigrant family after World War II, you know, moved to the U.S. when he was five and kind of really had nothing. And so he had a bit of that immigrant mindset where like, you know, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a professional and you'll always be safe. But in his heart, he was an entrepreneur. So he tried a lot of different things, but always kind of fell back on being a lawyer. And he's great at it. He loves it. He does estate planning. So he works with great people and he's almost more of a therapist sometimes than a lawyer. But 
he had that fallback. And there was a part of me too, that almost had a fallback too, where I was like, Oh, I probably should go do, you know, people are, I'll go do a JD MBA and you'll have a fallback. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I want to do chess or something. So anyway, that was going to be my question though, which is like, you know, bluntly an MBA is a non-risky move. It is seeking security actually by definition. Brian Halligan at HubSpot said that recently because he did one too. Um, like, how do you reflect on that? Like, did you want to downside protect? And how do you think about risk? I didn't really understand what an MBA was. So I didn't really view it as like a downside protection move for me or like a career advancement. I mean, it was literally at, at first a little bit, I got some career advice. I mean, coming out of college, I was so lost because I was an English major, but I really loved technology and like entrepreneurship but none of my education prepared me for that. And then I was just kind of scrappy and doing things. But, you know, my parents and my in-laws and everyone's like, hey, you need to go get like a real job and you need to go do some stuff. So I applied to like business school and law school. I didn't get anywhere. I didn't get in anywhere because it was like right after the dot com, you know, bubble boost, uh, bubble burst in 2001. And I got rejected to every school. And I was like, oh, man. So then. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go start and do something. And then later it kind of was always in my mind. And then I got pretty unhappy uh, in the entrepreneurial thing I was doing and thought, you know, actually it was my wife's like, Hey, you need to go back to school. Like you are miserable, like change pace, go do something. And so for me, it was more of like an, like an exploration of myself and like, what did I want to do? Not a fallback. What did you learn about yourself then? Because it's clearly been a clarifying moment for you. What did you change or learn about yourself through that process? Well, first of all, I learned that I, I was an asshole um, and I wasn't a very pleasant person. And uh, one of my dear friends out of business school, Andy Dunn, basically one day said to me, hey, let's have lunch. And we go have lunch. And he's like, hey, you come off like an asshole all the time. You don't smile that much. You, 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 you kind of like assume that you're in charge of everything that's going on and like it's off putting. And I was like, first of all, thank you for being brave enough to tell me. Second of all, like I'm going to work on that. I'm going to try and, you know, fix my RBF, my resting uh, unhappy face. And I'm going to, uh, you know, try to be a bit more alpha minus where it's like, instead of being in control of every situation in the room, step in if people want me to, or I'm willing to, but like leave some space for others. And so I learned so much about myself in that way. And I've really become a kinder, more compassionate, more self-aware person you know, through Stanford Business School. I'm not sure that happens everywhere, but it really happened for me. Um, so that was one major takeaway. I think the show does very well because I'm always very candid with my own troubles. Um, I, I have often been given the same feedback, but I also think, and I also get told by other people, what makes me very strong is the fact that I am kind of very direct, very concise. I don't mess around and I will guide conversations in a productive way that leads to outcomes. It might not be the most emotionally touch, like careful, but it's good. And so I, I guess what would you advise me having experienced this and then also having come through it? I don't want to lose the concision and productivity. What do you say? It's not, it's not an either or. It's not like be nice and then don't be direct. It's like you can be both. And I think a lot of it has to do with like the number of deposits and withdrawals you make in any relationship. And so it's like your bank account. So you need to have a way more positive interactions with someone if you're going to have a negative or a more or what they might feel as a negative or, or something. And so I do a lot of positive investing everywhere with everyone in my company, with my kids, with my wife, with all my relationships. And then that that builds up a buffer of trust and, and, and you know, kindness and all that. So then if I have a moment of maybe clarity that feels a little bit stinging or a little bit too much or something, they already know that there's a good amount of goodwill that I've built up there. I'm accused of the same. I'm pretty brash at times. I'm not everybody's fl uh, favorite flavor of ice cream. And, uh, you know, that's all there is to it. Do you find it disheartening when you do a lot of deposits and then when it comes to withdrawals, people don't give in the same way? I have accepted that. So that's just a role. That's a position. That is just 
comes with the territory at times of being sometimes a person in, in a position of power. Frankly, I mean, I'm a CEO of a company of hundreds of people. Um, I'm a father of children. I'm the most pro- one of the most proactive of my friends in terms of putting activities together and keeping in touch and doing those things. I, I'm fine with that. I embrace that role. So we go through that process at business school and we kind of come out a little bit more aware of who we are. How did chess.com come to be? Because I know you bought the domain, I think it was in 2006. Talk to me about that process. Chess.com is my third chess business, which is totally absurd to say, but I did. It's amazing, a, uh, it's amazing that you married such a wonderful person. <laughs> a third chess business. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I started while in college, kind of teaching chess to kids and setting up after school programs where lots of kids would come. And, you know, I was basically a labor arbitrage business where, you know, 30 kids would play, would pay, you know, 15 bucks an hour to do an after school club. And then I would pay an instructor, you know, $50 to teach a class. And I did that in, you know, dozens of schools while I was in college and after. And then I kind of got this idea to franchise that business with this other science company that was doing the same thing. And then they needed chess equipment. So I started, you know, buying chess equipment and reselling to them. And then I'm like, I got to cut out the middleman. So I start buying stuff in China. Then I had extra inventory. And I was like, I'm going to start selling this extra inventory online. So I created a website with my friend Jay. We started doing basically like the Amazon.com of chess before Amazon was doing anything except books. And so it kind of went from a teaching business to an e-commerce business. And then while I was doing e-commerce, I was like, customer acquisition cost is killing my business. I need to get off the Google AdWords or Google Ads at the time, build something that is meaningful for for people and for users so they will come and do that activity. And then I can sell them some chess equipment. I was like, I need to build a community. I want to build the MySpace of chess. You're not going to do that in an e-commerce site. I want to do that on chess.com. So then I contacted the people who owned it. Turned out they needed, they had like $5 million of like debt on the books and they needed to go bankrupt. So there's a bankruptcy auction and I bought the domain out of bankruptcy and me and Jay started chess.com okay so a couple of different things one how big was the e-commerce site when you realized hey i want to move into a community we were doing between one and two million dollars a year in i think a little over two million a year in revenue and was making good making good money yeah okay and so then we get the domain name and through that process how much did you end up paying for the domain name fifty six thousand dollars fifty six thousand dollars at the time were you like Shit, that's a lot of money. I mean, this is 2005, 2006. Were you like, hell, this is the most important address that we will have? Yeah, I mean, it was a no-brainer for me. I have zero concerns dropping that money. When I spoke to Leo, he asked the question of how much of a role has the domain name chess.com played towards your success? Ridiculously large role, especially at the beginning. And the beginning sets the tone for later. Now, I mean... In today's world, if we hadn't done it, if you would you have to start on chess.com? Probably not. But given the time that we started and how it worked and it was web first and all that. So it was critical at the time. And so by the time we hit the kind of mobile ecosystem where app downloads don't require a .com and some people don't even have websites, et cetera, it's way less important now. But we were already massive at that time. And so it was fundamental. Do you buy chess.com? And then what? Because we, we can look at it today and it looks unbelievable. But like, how did you get the first million users? I opened up Microsoft Word and I started building wireframes in Microsoft Word. That's how uh, that's kind of where I was coming from. And, uh, you know, had a friend of mine from college design a logo. And then I kind of handed over this, you know, then I took these wireframes from Microsoft Word and then I started building uh, the front end of these web pages in in uh, Macromedia Dreamweaver. That's how long ago that was. And then I would build these web pages, push them to, through an FTP server to a fake domain name that we just that I and my co-founder, technical co-founder Jay had, and he would take that HTML CSS document, put it in with some PHP and MySQL, and like push it live to the server. And that's how we got started. And then, so we built a homepage, we built a login, we built forums, we built blogs, we built news, we built everything but how to play chess at the start. And we're like, we're just going to do a community and people can play on Yahoo or on ICC and then they can say what their rating is and we're just going to be a social media profile. But then people started coming and they're like, dude, we want to play chess. And we're like, okay, 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 we'll build that. But that was really hard to do because back in the day, people were downloading clients to play. Gaming was all done on like executable programs 
programs on your computer. Doing it in the browser was like an insanity at the time. JavaScript wasn't mature enough. There was no web sockets or anything like that. So, it, you know, that's that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> okay, so how many users did we have what before we hit the actual chess playing just on the community build? It was definitely under a million. Uh, but people every day, you know, a few hundred people would would, would sign up. I mean, maybe a thousand or more would come to chess.com and then we would convert, you know, a fairly high percentage of them to just creating an account. But there wasn't a ton for them to do other than forums. But back in 2006, seven, eight, nine, forums was a big part of the internet. So it was, it was, it was popular. When in your mind did you have product market fit? When did you go to Jay? We've got this, like, this is good. It was after we launched the learning product where you would go online and move a piece and it would give you a response. And we took basically all the learning instruction material that we bought out of bankruptcy along with the domain name, which was called Chess Mentor. And we put that online. And then we said, if you want access to this, you got to subscribe. And once we did that, we immediately had people subscribing and we're like, now we have money. People are, are voting with their dollars and saying, we like this. And then we're like, okay, it's time to like 100% all in on this. At this time, what was the mission? I know it sounds like a strange question, but every company has a mission. You know, I think most of them are pretty fluffy and bullshit, to be honest. Um, yeah. How do you think about the mission then and mission-driven companies, given this was the time when you had to create it? Yeah, the mission was very clear, clearly to serve the chess community. And we were part of the chess community. I mean, Jay was a strong, you know, is a stronger chess player than me. And, but I was very much into the game and we wanted to serve ourselves. We wanted a place that felt fun for us, knowing that if we did that for us, we would serve the chess community more broadly. So the mission at the start was to like make cool stuff for the chess community. So for a long time, it was serve the chess community only. It later became serve the community and like be the best place to work. And we kind of like it was very early on that we said we want this to be a place where we do things differently, but people really love working here and participating with us. So whether you're an employee or a contractor or whether you're a grandmaster, etc., you know, we want to be a great partner for you. And so we wanted really help. I wanted to make a place that I wanted to work, you know, again. So, so we did that and that became a second mission of ours. And then fast forward when COVID came and the queen's gambit hit and our numbers like five X overnight, it grew the game of chess five X. And we, before that had never really thought that we had the tools to grow the game of chess. We thought that people who were interested were interested and we'll capture that and serve it, but we didn't think we could grow it. But now our third mission is to grow the game of chess and we are doing everything we can to get more people interested in this game that we love. We're going to move actually to, to Queen's Gambit later on. I, I want to actually just kind of stay with the chronology and kind of work through those different missions. You mentioned like adding the chess mentor, the learning, people paying for the product and serving that community. When we think about the decision to raise or not raise, why at that time did you decide to not raise? Because I'm sure you could have done. You were now making money. You had traffic. Things look good. What was that conversation like between you and Jay? Oh, no. We, we tried for like the first five years to raise money. <laughs> <laughs> we tried many times. We tried angels. We tried, I met, I met Peter Thiel. I went, I met a bunch of different angels. I went up and down. I used all my connections up and down Silicon, you know, you know, Sand Hill road to try to raise money for chess. And just time and time again was told the market's too small. This is uninvestable. Maybe I'll give you a little bit of money at like an insanely like low valuation. And I was like, ah, I don't need it that bad. So anyway, when you look back, did you do anything wrong? Like, would you have changed how you presented? Well, I mean, now knowing what I know, I mean, chess is a much bigger market. I don't think I did anything wrong. I think everybody was wrong. I think consensus, including from me, was the chess was too small. And so why would you invest in a business that you thought would, you know, make $10 million in revenue at its best? Why would you do that? I'm just playing devil's advocate here and I may be stirring the pot. What if they were right? Just pause and just say, and like, 
if you think about venture being five, ten billion dollar outcomes, if we think about a two hundred million dollar revenue business, a three hundred million dollar revenue business on public market multiples, you're looking at six, eight, nine, ten x. It's still hard to see the five billion dollar exit. Am I being short sighted? I don't care about. I mean, the, I don't care about money. I'll be honest. I just don't care about it, and so it's just not the lens I look at. I mean, I think if you're a venture investor saying like, "Hey, I need to get to a five billion exit," like, chess may not be your investment, and that's totally okay. Why do you not care about money? Just love to understand that. Like, have you always been that way? I love experiences. I love having things. I love the security of like feeling safe and all, and having my needs and most of my wants met. But I I know people where money is like self worth or it's a scoreboard or it's like precious something, and I just don't know why I don't feel that. Like I have friends who don't love food. I love I have a deep relationship and love of food. But I have some friends who are like, yeah, I eat when I'm hungry and food is good. But I'm like, no, 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 I love food. Well, it's kind of opposite. I like. Okay, I appreciate money, but I don't love money or I'm not motivated by it. I don't care about it in the same way. I don't know why. I I used to place a lot of emphasis on it, and it's like I am valuable because I have money, and then I'm valuable to other people, which did not necessarily make me happy for a long period of time. Where do you determine your self worth from then? Because I think I'm in a bit of a self discovery of like, if it's not that, then why am I valuable to someone? I would start and say. And this is something I, I every human struggles with. But the first question would should be why are you valuable to yourself? If your entire self worth is a reflection of other people, you'll always be chasing that mirror. You have to start with good, balanced self worth and self value. And that, and I'm not, I'm not preaching to you. I'm not your therapist, but that's for, for me. And that's a struggle for me as well. Like I'm a very extroverted person. I love being around people. I love doing all that, but. Self care, self talk, self worth, all of that is like very critical to my well being and makes me a better person to show up for others. And then also that interaction is important. Anyway, how do I answer the question of why am I valuable to myself? Like, how would you answer that? There is inside of all of us an inner person, an inner being, and you have to get comfortable and happy with who that person is. And you can do that in a number of ways. Some people do meditation. Other people do alone time where they where they can find peace in long runs or walks or other things. Other people get it from achieving something and being in the flow. And, you know, it could be skiing. It could be sports. It could be writing. It can be all sorts of things. But I think there's something about that. And, uh, you know, another day we could unpack. But I, I did do an ayahuasca retreat one time. It's the only drug I've ever done. Uh, I did an ayahuasca. And, and part of that journey for me was to get comfortable with myself and really be happy and, and, and solid and, and grounded in myself. When was that? Two years ago. Did that change how you operate as an entrepreneur? It totally did. How so? My biggest takeaway from this experience was, is this so weird? I grew up, you know, in a, in a Mormon home and belief and culture, and I lived that lifestyle. I never did any drugs or alcohol. <laughs> and so then to go do an ayahuasca retweet, re- retreat, I was so afraid to do that, to be in a mind, an altered mind state. But when I did that, it actually, for the first time, took all the other mind altering things out of my mind. And I was present only with my mind. And my biggest takeaway from that retreat, and it took drugs to get me there. It's medicine. Sorry, for those who practice, it's called medicine. But it took a medicine drug to tell to teach me that I am every day microdosing on drugs. I am microdosing on Slack. I am microdosing on email. I am microdosing on Zoom. I am under the influence of drugs every single day and every single moment of my life. And I am in an altered state because of that. And so I it, the most helpful thing from that was to realize that when I am feeling anxiety or when I am feeling something, I am probably and I'm not centered. I'm probably under the influence of something. And it may not be a drug as we characterize it, but it's probably slack. It's probably a message someone sent me. It's probably a fear. It's probably something someone said on Reddit. I am under the influence.
And so then you change what you do? Like, you can't avoid email. You can't avoid Zoom, sadly. No, but with just the recognition of saying, ah, I'm feeling this because of this thing, but I am actually a safe like grounded person outside of that. I am not my Slack. I am not my inbox. I am not my social media presence. I am something deeper, safer, more foundational than that. I love that. I, I've, I've never done an ayahuasca retreat. Um, I, I have done alcohol. I, I don't drink anymore. Can I ask, going back to the, the fundraising element, yeah. when you, you said you tried and it didn't happen, as a result of not raising money, did you do things differently? I had to do it differently. Everything that I, everything I saw going on in Silicon Valley was based on large amounts of readily available capital. That means getting the best, you know, co-founder from, you know, Berkeley or Stanford or, and that means like setting up an office on, you know, California Ave. It meant having a full-time, you know, chef and masseuse in the office. It meant, you know, everybody hiring the best people you could, putting them in the office and, you know, doing everything right there. And later on, it meant doing everything in the cloud and it meant buying ads on Facebook. It meant, you know, scaling up as quickly as you could. Everything was like spend, 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 because eventually, eventually you'll think about monetizing. We did the opposite. We thought about monetizing immediately. Everybody was remote. There was no office. Our engineers were spread all over the world. My co-founder was my college buddy from San Jose State. And, you know, it was like everything was the opposite. And because we had no money. And I'm really grateful for that. Sorry. So what, no, it's fantastic to hear that you don't need me and my whole profession. I'm thrilled. Uh, <laughs> uh, just don't tell anyone, right? Okay. Uh, uh, my question to you is, having been through that experience, having done creativity because you had to, what do you think and advise founders when you see them today raising again more money than than we ever thought possible? I think raising money feels a lot like earning money in that it's a validation it's a per, it's a self validation i'm i'm worth the money my idea is worth the money it can fill a hole in your soul and it can make you feel like you're going to be more successful because of it and you can i mean honestly there are a lot of businesses that need capital do not get me wrong you, there are a lot of businesses that need capital it's critical it's important you can't do certain things without it you don't get immediate roi you need a runway all of that is true but there are times where I have seen people over raise money or raise money at times they didn't need it or pursue things within their business that were, were not right because they had money and knew they could get it. Where did not having money damage you? If you look back to the early days, where are you like, ah, if we had $5 million there, we really would have been in a different spot. It's very hard to say. I'm, I'm not a person who regrets very often or, or is you know backwards reflective in that way because everything turned out great. And I, I, were, I don't know what would have happened if we had hired a bunch of local people. Would we have moved too fast and done the wrong thing? I mean, there's something about moving do think, slow. Do you, do you think you went slowly? That's interesting. We definitely went slowly. Why do you say that though? I mean, like when you look at the trajectory, not not that slow. I mean, companies that are venture back take as long as you did to reach the revenues that you did, the scale that you did. I, I'm just in trend what years? I mean, that's a... Sadly so, Eric. <laughs> Sadly so. <laughs> I just read about this game. I can, I'm an, I don't remember the title. There's just, there's a mobile game that launched literally last year in the last nine months that in that, those nine months did $400 million in revenue. Some kind of like snow survival game or something. And I'm like... I don't know. Like, maybe I'm doing it wrong. I, I don't know. I mean, Dr. Lior, he, he made a lot of money faster than, than chess.com did. Maybe. I mean, isn't that, Lior is an incredible entrepreneur, so I'm very thrilled to have invested in him. But not having money drives creativity in a lot of ways, as we discussed. Yeah. Customer acquisition is one where traditionally you put money in the funnel. You mentioned the e-commerce business on Google ads, Facebook ads. You put money in the funnel and hopefully it comes out with positive unity con. They didn't have that money. So how did you do creative customer acquisition? And what were some of those big lessons? Yeah, we'd totally been burned on, on paid acquisition. And we pretty much made a, a, 
you know, a very firm rule that we weren't going to do paid acquisition. And so instead we said, we're going to take any money that we have and we're going to put it into content because content drives user value and, and it drives SEO. So we're, our team has always been very good at like capturing demand on any platform, whether it's Google or, you know, app stores, because we create content, we create value when people interact with that, you know, it signals to the search engines that it's something valuable. And so it's always been an investment in content. The next platform of discoverability after kind of Google and, you know, app stores was YouTube. And you got to get content and it's got to be good. And then after that was Twitch and we followed that. And then it was shorts and TikTok and we followed that. And so we always followed the content where it was and worked with really creative people and excellent people. And we invested in the product and we invested in the content and we invested in capturing search, but not paid. So I'm sorry to every all the businesses that operate on, on, on ad revenue, but you know, we don't participate in that. I'm really interested there because I mean, content's obviously my business as well. Did you do a portfolio approach and see what worked in terms of content channel? Or did you just pick well each time? Time. I just like to understand that transitory moment when you're deciding the next content platform to move to. I think we were smart about it. Um, one of my other classmates at Stanford, you asked about MBA, you know, is it worth it? I have some brilliant classmates uh, from Stanford who've been really great to work with, including Andy, including Lior. Another one was Marcelo Camberos, who uh, was at Ipsy. And he and I talked early on and he told me how valuable getting a YouTube influencer was to their, you know, uh, cosmetic subscription business. And I was like, okay. And I thought about that. And you know, we started looking at that kind of, you know, early influencer, you know, market, you know, marketing. And we found some really great chess creators, you know, and, you know, we kind of started working that angle and it was really valuable for us. Super did important. Pay, how did you pay them? What was that structure like? I'm intrigued. <laughs> I mean, it's always been a little different. We've some, some is through kind of like chess.com affiliate. So if someone signs up on chess.com and then they are become a premium subscriber, they'll get a cut of that. Sometimes it was just some cash or an ambassador. Like we would do a, a year long ambassador for, you know, some dollars. Also, we also create value for them because we then expose them to our community and then they get bigger and make money in their own channels. And so sometimes it's a scratch my back. I'll scratch your back with embedding them on like our platform where people can discover them and then go to their platform. So it's kind of a range of all of those. It's really interesting. It, it reminds me of Logan Paul actually in Prime, if you'll forgive me for that analogy, because like now they're such a big platform themselves that when they work with talent and influencers, they actually promote them too in a similar yep. way. And so yep. I, I mean, would you have done anything different about content? You know, when I look back at mine, I would have moved to YouTube a lot earlier. I was too late to YouTube, not too late. We're on it now and we've done well, but I only did it two years ago and I should have done it five years ago. Yeah, I think podcasting is a little different because there was like these other platforms. And then when did YouTube become a podcasting platform? You know, I think for chess, chess is visual. And so as soon as YouTube came out, we were like, we want to do that. And as soon as, I mean, we were doing live streaming back when it was Justin.tv, long before it was Twitch. You know, our very first live event that we really promoted was, you know, Danny Wrench, who's our chief chess officer versus David Pruce, who was, you know, at the time, our head of content. We put $1,000 cash on a plate in between those two guys on there and then had them play chess against each other. And that was kind of the beginning of our kind of our live streaming. And so we had, so, you know, we would put kind of static content on YouTube that was in the, you know, 10 to 30 you know, minute range. And then we would do live shows on, you know, Justin TV or livestream.com and eventually Twitch. But now we stream all over the place, but we were, and then, you know, Facebook was a different strategy. We would do a lot of quotes and, and memes there. And then Twitter was a little different. So we've actually been pretty smart on how each platform responds to the different types of content. What's the dominant platform today for you? A lot of browsers and a lot of providers have removed attribution to make it really hard to tell. So Twitch does no attribution, you know, Safari does not do attribution. And so it, it's gotten harder to tell, but we've seen a tremendous amount of growth. I would say our most recent wave was completely driven off of short forms, whether it's YouTube shorts, Instagram, you know, uh, stuff or reels or, you know, TikTok. It has 
totally driven. So we actually have separate teams on a per channel basis. Do you have separate teams or do you have like one social team? We have kind of one team with kind of experts and people who have feels for different things. And the probably the smartest thing we've done is like old men step, you know, old people step out of the room and like hire smart young people and young women and to kind of get in there with the voice and figure it out. And so it's just, I'm kind of a stand back and watch these young, amazing people like drive this stuff. And it's, it's incredible to watch. When you look at the membership scaling, was there needle moving moments? We'll talk about Queen's Gambit. We'll talk about COVID. But in the earlier years, was it really a continuous up, but gradual? Or were there very strategic, like significant moments where it really inflected? There were a couple of moments that things took off. So one was with the kind of Twitch creator, streamer, influencer. That was a big one. Another one, I'm actually going to give a shout out to Keith. We talked about our, our, our mutual friend, Keith. Keith was in the car with me one day and he said, Eric, I like chess. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm that, I'm that like smart enough to do it. And it, also sometimes I feel like it's too frustrating and I go do the puzzles and I feel like I get all the puzzles wrong. It's not fun. And I was like, man, he, Keith just told me that chess isn't fun, that doing puzzles isn't fun because he gets them wrong. And he, he, that conversation triggered us to build a product called Puzzle Rush, where you just start with all the easiest puzzles and then they get harder over time. You feel all this success and all this easy fun, and then it gets hard and you challenge yourself and you fail. But that product was super needle moving for us. It, 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 it lit the world on fire. Malcolm Gladwell wrote about this product. Like it, it, it was massive for us. And so there were just these little moments, whether it was product or content that would, would, would inflame things and heat things up for a while. And then it would stick. Does Keith know that he was the reason that that was created? I know I told him, but he may not remember, but I did tell him that. How important is early wins in activities? And so like you said there about kind of the, the consistent winning early, how important is having early wins to the success of an activity? It pains me to say this, but somebody who wins their first game of chess is two to three times more likely to stay around than someone who loses their first game. And so then you're like, well, you got to make sure that people win their first game. But doing that is like morally problematic in some ways. Do you make them play a bot so they but they think they're playing a person? Do you set them up with an opponent who's super, you know, low rated compared to them? Do you and there's all these things you can do, but they all have there's moral hazard in all of it and we've kind of avoided it. And so what we're trying to do is push people toward not playing a person first, but knowingly playing a coach bot personality where they will win and feel good but not to just throw them in the pool of players against other people where there's a 50-50 chance they're going to lose. That's the honest truth. Two to three X more likely to retain. That's pretty incredible. Um, yep. Yeah, I was thinking, fuck, play a bot. Come on, dude. Think of our retention numbers. Uh, can, can I ask, how have retention numbers changed over time? Have they stayed relatively stable? And like, what is, what is you know, I love Akin and Neil because they're so freaking smart on retention, bluntly. How do you think about great retention and lessons from that? We are we have not historically been a uh, metrics driven business. We are we've been a heart and mission and chess driven business. We are getting smarter about it. How did General Atlantic take that? Like <laughs> they they knew who we were when they when they you know married us. Uh, but they've been very patient and helpful to you know they understand where we're at. That's a whole other topic. But we've had a very good um, coming together and seeing things. We started on different sides of the mountain. We've come together. To, to, to really understand each other. It's been actually really awesome. What, do you um, know, do you know what, like, talk, talk to me about not being a metrics business. Like, why is it not better to be a metrics business? Just help me understand that because that is so different to what I normally hear. I know. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, we've always guided things through what we wanted to do and what felt right and what was in our guts and what was on mission and what sounded cool. And, you know, we've always done that. I think that was really healthy for us at the start. I think now having a blended balance of understanding those things um, is helpful to us. But how, I do want to go back how, to the metrics thing at some point. So I want to, yeah, good. How do you determine success if metrics are not at the forefront of what drives decision making? Like obviously I run media teams. We are very metrics driven and that helps me 
assign success or not to someone in some respects. It's the joy of media in a lot of ways. How do you determine success with no with not a metric first mindset? I mean, individually at the company, I think people don't think of success. I think they think of fulfillment. I think they think of effort. I think they think of mission and serving the community and they take joy in that. And so if they do something that is well received by the community or helps us grow the game, they feel good about that. And so then how would that manifest in numbers? You know, we, we, we track active users, we track subscribers, we track, you know, usage of different things. Um, and people kind of, you know, they know how many members we have and how that's going. And so it's just kind of a general happy go lucky feel, but there are numbers we're starting to look at differently. What numbers matter most to you today? You know, our, our daily active users is a big deal for me, um, because it's very easy to just see how many people today are logging in to enjoy chess. That's very simple. There, you know, more though, I would say we're, we're starting to, you know, Duolingo, you know, their Kerr metric was super valuable. Um, so we're now looking at that as a primary. So, can you, which can basically you explain, for the, can you, yeah, can you explain what that means? It's kind of your, your retention rate of your active users, which means if somebody on week one was active and was again active in week two, What's the likelihood that they come back in week three? And so it's somebody who's shown a bit of a habit or, you know, they've shown that they're invested. They like the product. What's the chances that they'll continue to like it? And how does that differ from like a D30 number? Just so I understand that. I think that what it helps you see is not just like I logged in 30 days later, but that I made a habit out of it and I'm coming back regularly each week. And it's become, it's not just, I, Hey, I sent you a push notification on day 30. So you came back and did something, but it's like, no, you made this a part of what you do. And so we have that metric. We have DAU, any others where we're like, mm, this one. So one of the ones that we're focusing more on now is a percentage of learners over players. Obviously chess as a service, people come and they play. It's like the primary thing they do, um, which, which not everybody does. Some people come and they still do forums or they watch our shows or there's other things or they, you know, different things, but the majority of people come and play. But not everybody turns into a learner. Our business is funded by learners. Playing is free. Learning is behind the paywall. And so the percentage of people who want to learn and improve as a percentage of players is something that helps us understand that people are getting greater value out of our product than just playing. Can I ask what percentage of people are learners versus players it's different per product and so we're trying we're trying to kind of wrap it into one number so i i don't have that exactly but you know let's just say that of our active users you know it's it's actually a strangely low number but it's like 60 percent of our active users come in on a day and play half of them will do a will do puzzles so half of that number will do puzzles and then half of that number again will do lessons. Game review is actually the most popular. A lot of people will do game review. So that's like a, a, a anyway, so we're trying to we're trying to wrap that into a more cohesive product for everybody. But that is those are the three things that people pay for. That that's really interesting, but actually that's that's kind of more than I thought though still. If you if on those numbers it's kind of like 10%, really if you think about it in that way, which is reasonably high actually um in my mind so, on, so just we, we could say we've got about 150 a little over 150 160 million registered members we have take a weekly active users is probably around 10 percent of that around 15 million about 10 percent of that are active subscribers and active subscribers means they pay monthly they pay monthly or yearly wow what, what's the difference? Uh, sorry, I'm so interested. And anything that I'm prying too much, you can just say, Harry, fuck off. Um, but like, how many pay weekly versus yearly? What's that mix up? The majority of people pay, pay yearly. Um, and most people do tend toward our highest paid product because they get the most access. And our retention on paid users is really good. Another one of my Stanford classmates, uh, Cotty Johnson worked at Activision and he's like, wow, I thought I had seen amazing retention numbers with World of Warcraft. Uh, you guys are up there as like very sticky subscriber base. What's your retention on paid users? I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm just saying it's very high, but that changed. Sorry, just to say that changed when the two, we had two different 
you know, I sent you our numbers. We got some interesting graphs where it's kind of grew and then it had a, a Queen's Gambit bump and then it had a more recent 2023 bump. The Queen's Gambit cohort, people saw the show. They saw chess pieces moving on the ceiling and they're like, I want to learn chess and get better. Those people um, subscribed at a higher rate than normal than normal baseline. What do you mean? What do you mean they subscribed at a higher rate? There was more of them that entered the funnel. The percentage of people who became subscribers was higher than our previous kind of steady state cohorts. Oh, wow. Because they wanted to be learners. They wanted to learn and get better. And Beth Harmon made them feel like they could be world champions. It was awesome. Did that bring in a load of low quality leads, though, which is like, yay, we want to be Beth Harmon. We want to learn. And then actually they're like, oh, fuck it. I've got kids and I'm busy and uh, and they churn. Was that a leaky bucket, actually, or did they retain? I was really interested by that. They subscribed at a higher rate, but then retained at a lower rate, to your point. And that kind of, so we swallowed that. But it's not like it went up and back down. It went up and stayed up significantly. So, yes, it was net massive growth. But, yes, they later retained at a lower rate. Yeah. That's what I was. Yeah, totally get that. But then we went to 2023 where the cheating scandal and mittens, the chess bot and short form content blew up. And then we also just exploded in schools. But now you have a whole bunch of high school kids and junior high kids and younger people getting into chess and they subscribe at a way lower rate. And so registration numbers went through the roof. But our subscriber numbers didn't didn't follow. Can I ask you, when you look at these kind of very strategic and clinical moments in the company's trajectory, respectfully, a lot of them were outside of your control. When we yeah. look at COVID, when we look at Queen's Gambit, no execution that you did drove that. No offense. Um, what do you advise on entrepreneurs given the serendipity, fate, luck of life? Be in the right place, man. Like be be paddling we we always say that we're in the boat and we are paddling and our sail is up and we are but we're also rowing and when the wind comes we're already ready and we're steering and we're doing the best we can but we're not in charge of when the wind comes always you can try you can try to find the current and do different things but you know you're not wrong that sometimes it's very it's stuff outside your control that you know makes a massive impact in a business and you know we've had several black swan moments uh, compounding and it's been pretty pretty phenomenal when you look back now is there anything that you would or could have done to capitalize on the moment more be more ready had more content had more products done anything to capitalize on those two moments more? I mean, we can always have a better product that's better for beginners and learners and onboarding and all of that. But it's actually interesting that that kind of earlier product I talked about with Puzzle Rush, we made a focus in 2018 to make our product more fun, more fun bots, more fun puzzles, more fun everything. And right as we finished that, COVID came. And then we were starting on short form content and more fun bots and different types of things. And right then cheating scandal came. So we were doing all the things to make the game at the first was to make it kind of more fun. And then later was kind of more content readiness. So we did the things to be in the right position at the time. And we really feel lucky that our strategy was met with the, you know, the, the one time, you know, exogenous events or whatever okay and so we look at these very seismic moments that have incredible trajectory moving abilities for a business you then decide at some point specifically in 2022 to raise cash from ga why did not, you just not totally accurate but go ahead go for, no go for it i would I, I, accuracy is important after we were rebuffed by all investors early on. We kind of said, we don't want to take any money. We're going to do this ourselves. Because before we had no success and no one wanted to invest. Later, we had success and everyone wants to invest. And we're like, you know, you can, uh, you can, you know, no, thank you. I have a lot of no, thank you emails out there. I'm sure many people watching this program have gotten those no, thank you emails from me. But someone came along and said, hey, I really love chess. Yes, I'm an investor, but I want to put my own money in and I want to just, I want to be, I want to invest. And, and I was like, okay, I live in Silicon Valley. One day I want to buy a house. Like maybe some of us want to take some money off the table and we'll sell some second, you know, some secondary and we'll, you know, we'll do a little bit of a liquidity internally. And so we sold a small amount of, you know, 10% of the company early on. 
And that guy was like, you know, and he's like, okay, well, I need this preference and I need this thing. And we're like, nope, no deal. Go away. You're on the same terms as all of us or get out. And he's like, okay, 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 fine. I'll, I will invest. Same terms as everybody. No preference, nothing, no guaranteed returns. I just want to own equity. Okay, great. Now we're all on the same level. He invests 10%. He's like, ah, I love chess. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be an investor forever. Okay, great. Fast forward a couple of years. He's like, hey, I got to get out. I got some LPs that need some money. I'm like, LPs? I didn't even know about this. Like, you told me you were going to be in forever. He's like, no, no, no. I got to exit. But I got this other guy who loves chess. His name is Isai Scheinberg, founder of Poker Stars. He loves chess. He wants to meet you. I meet with him. He's like, hey, I want to buy in. I want 50% of the company. We're like, get out of here. We're like, no chance, no way. And so, and he's like, okay, I'll do less, but we want these terms. And we're like, get out of here. No chance, no way. He's finally, he's like, all right. So we come to terms and he buys like, you know, a little more, uh, more a little more than 20 some percent. We're like, okay, we took a little money off the table, but he's like, Hey, I love chess. I'm gonna be here forever. A couple of years go by. He's like, Hey, I got to get out. I'm like, get out. Why you love chess? What if it's going well? So then he's like, nope, I got to sell. And he's like, either I'm going to sell to who I want to, or you guys can choose who I sell to, and you guys can do that. So now I start running this process where I start talking to all these people and private equity this and different you know venture firm there and all these different things because I got to buy him out. That's when we met GA. But again, it was to buy out existing equity. It was not to raise money. There was no primary money put in whatsoever. It was all just buying founders equity and equal ownership. Do you regret selling to that first investor? Totally. Huh. Every day. Every day I think about it. I have, I have so few regrets in life, but that is one. <laughs> what does that lead to? It's not a great thought. I don't like it. And But I, we're here now. And so I have to believe that the best things happen and the universe will take care of it all. But I mean... How much, how much did you sell that first 10% for? I actually don't remember. 20 million, 20 million valuation? Whoa. Okay, so you're doing like $2 million for the co-founders. Maybe something like that. Wow. Okay. And then and then the Poker Stars guy bought it at what price? Maybe around three times that. Okay. Valuation. And then GA paid ten times that? Yeah. Wow. Do you like working with institutional investors? I like Tanzine. And I like Anton and I like Jesse and I like the people I work with. I have to say. I do like the people at GA. I don't want them to know that. So please cut that out. Just kidding. You can leave it. But I do like them a lot. Um, did, did, I, I do too. I've had Anton on the show. I've had Martin Escobari. Yeah. I think GA are one of the best. So totally. Did things change post having an institutional investor? Of course it changed. But the mission didn't change. And I know you're like, ah, mission driven. Maybe that's BS. It's not BS for us because chess is like, it's a stewardship for us. And we really do feel the mission. I don't know how to do a mission driven insurance arbitrage business, but you can do a mission driven chess business. Their view is drive, you know, maximum shareholder value. But you do that through serving your community and growing your game and building a great product. And our view is build a great product to serve the community. And okay, fine, it's going to create shareholder value. But it's not, that's just, it's, we're looking at the same thing, but just opposite of each other. I get it. It's inputs and outputs. Driving shareholder value creates more enterprise value. That, yeah. That. So I, I totally understand that. Um, and I, I buy your mission, by the way. I just would be infuriated to work with it. <laughs> but I, I, I totally believe it. And I think it's wonderful. Um, so I very much am loving it. You said something earlier and you beat everyone to this trend. You said that you were remote from day one. And I wanted to talk about this. And, you know, many of the mutual friends said we had to. <laughs> Can you help me understand why is remote work better? Because I can't think of a role which is done better remotely. And people disagree with me. And I'm always open to have my mind changed. So make the case for remote, Eric. First of all, talent is all over the world. And if you are geographically confined on talent, you have a smaller hiring pool and you are now competing in ways, you know, that are hard. It's hard to compete against these massive dangled comp packages in certain areas and things. It's very hard. I would say that it's it's been amazing 
to, to have an international team where we have people in India working with people in Serbia, working with people in Argentina, working with people in New York. And it's just a beautiful thing. I don't know how to tell you. It is so beautiful. And because it's mission driven and because the weight, I always say the weight of our mission crushes egos. If you have an ego, this is the wrong place for you. Get out and go find somewhere you can serve yourself. The weight of our mission will crush you. It crushes politics. It crushes bullshit. It crushes egos. And so we're all there to serve the mission. And when all that other stuff is gone, you're now collaborating and serving each other to serve the mission. It, it works for us. And so we have really smart people who are passionate about what we do who come from everywhere. And the other thing is, is they feel respected in their lives. They can show up to work when they want. They can do the work that they want. They can walk their dog in the middle of the day. They can take time off. They can do what they need to do. And so it is a joy for them to work. They don't feel trapped in the office. They don't feel like they have to show up early to do FaceTime. They don't feel like they have to be the last one to leave. They don't have to pretend like they're busy. It's so life enabling to them that they're grateful to have the job and they give everything to it. And that includes me. I love love my life. I love the fact that I'm sitting in a room and that there's no one around to bother me and that I'm doing this and I don't have to worry about if someone is judging me for how I'm spending my time or what's going on. So I don't know. It's freeing. Do you miss the human interaction and do you miss the creativity that comes from being in person? I have a lot. I am, I am married with four kids. I don't miss uh, human interaction. I know that some people do. And that is a thing that, you know, they'll go to a coffee shop or they'll go at a co-working space or, you know, I, I understand that's a real part. It is not a challenge for me in my life. What have been the biggest lessons in terms of what it makes takes to make remote work, having done it since day one? I get this question sometimes. I'm like, I don't know if these lessons apply outside of chess. So, uh, you know, apply with caution, but like being super mission driven and having people who really are consumers of your own product, they live the chess world and life. So they get to participate in that thing. And the other crazy thing is that we are nobody's highest paying job. We immediately filter for highest pay, like if you are looking for your highest paying job, it will not be chess.com. And so anyone who's hoping for that will go take a job somewhere else. And they are here for passion and they are here. We pay as well as we can, but they're never going to leave for money. They stay here for lifestyle. They stay here for mission. They stay here because we care about them and take care of them. But, but we don't churn people who are just constantly looking for the next most money they can make. Those people don't take jobs at chess.com. When people have got through the door who aren't mission driven, who do have egos, who do have desires on finances, it's inevitable they get through the door. What did you not see that you should have seen? Sometimes they say money doesn't matter or they're, you know, and then later it becomes, you know, oh, I had a kid, I need this, I, you know, or a crazy offer comes in. And we're, we're always like, hey, we're super happy for you. If that's now the important for you, go do that thing. That's great. We're happy for you. Other people will... You know, so so it's usually a life circumstance will change. Occasionally, we'll get like a bullshitter who will come through, and suddenly they come in and they seem like the nicest person. And then they come in and they're like kingdom building and you know backstabbing and stuff, and we're just like get out, like immediately get out. What are the biggest mistakes you see founders make when they're trying to do remote well? I think treating people like kind of like assets, you know, kind of treating people like workers who are supposed to do a job rather than like teammates who are on a mission to do something. Everybody wants to be respected and everybody wants to feel like what they're doing has meaning. And I think when people feel that it's like, I'm task oriented to do this thing that generates this, that makes money. I know that's what a business is and I know that's what work is. But when deep down, when you feel that, I think it's hard to show up when you feel that that's what you're doing. I think when you show up to work and feel like there are people that I care about who are relying on me, or there's a community that cares about what I do, it's very easy to show up for those people. Do you pay people according to national averages? You mentioned global workforce. How do you think about like benchmarking and comp aligned to national average or same across the world? No, it's definitely nationally regulated. It's very hard to do. Compensation planning for a completely global company is super hard to do. Why is it so hard? Hard and what have you done well at? Like, how do you do it well? I don't, I probably hired the first 300 to 400 people myself who worked at the company. 
And I would just say to them, hey, how much money do you need to do this job? And if we can make that, we'll do it. And if not, I'll let you know. But really, what do you need to do this? Because I'm not going to make you an offer because I don't know your life. I don't know how much the average person makes around you. I don't know what your expectations are. So tell me what you need. And if I can meet that, great. And if I can't, hey, we part ways and we understand. And that's what we did. And people would say, hey, I can do this. And I would say, oh, that's great. Or, oh, I can't do that. This is probably my max here. And it's a take it or leave it. It's a little bit like that. And, and it, But what's been great is to see globalizing like... People, wages have gone up because someone who used to in Serbia work for $9 an hour, now they have a global marketplace to work. So that their wages have gone up a ton. That's great for them. And I'm happy. And we've tried to adjust and do all that we can. But again, some people just frankly wage out of our company if that's what matters to them. When you said, hey, what do you need? What percentage of the time did it come in above versus below? Probably slightly above more than more than add or under. Speaking of kind of money and what you need, you mentioned Andy Dunn before. I spoke to him before the show and he said that you're wonderful in many ways, but you don't really like capitalism. What do you think he means by that? And you've mentioned before capitalism 2.0. What does that mean? If you look at the value structure of what's being... I mean, this is an age old argument. It, look at the work that's being done by the people who are doing it. Look at the people who are managing those people. And then look at the people who invest in there in the finance industry and look at the where the value flows versus where the work is being done. And it's just disproportionate. And I understand that capital returns and a healthy market where people can invest their dollars to get returns is great for everybody's wealth creation who has money. I understand that people having money creates jobs. I understand that, you know, money does flow down, even if, you know, trickle down economics isn't totally, you know, whatever. I understand a lot of these things, but I also understand that like there's a driving human greed that makes it so that money doesn't flow in some ways to the people who need it or deserve it. And I don't know how to solve for this yet. What about ownership of companies? I mean this in the most non-provocative way. If that was the case, what about splitting ownership across the teams? Giving everyone much larger ownership so you can have vesting schedules, but ensuring that the company is owned by the teams. I love this. I wish that it were easier to do. For example, the global system of legality is so hard and painful. The moment you are an equity owner, you have a K-1 in 37 states and 12 countries. And the tax bill alone for managing the equity, tiny equity stake you have can be worth more than the equity itself. And it depends on your structures and your countries, but like ownership is so hard to do. And it's a real barrier to doing that. The other challenge is vesting schedules. So maybe someone owns, but someone comes in, works early, bails out. Now they have a bunch of ownership, then, you know, but then they participate in all the upside of when they weren't there. And so there's a whole bunch of things around maybe the valuation when they joined versus when they left and they can capture that value. But there's a lot of problems you dilute out. And then so so ownership structure in general is just is very problematic. I think that is where the answer needs to happen. But there's so much regulatory and legal and global stuff to fix around that before we can really get to that. It might be one of the only few truly crypto native cases which makes sense, actually, if you think about a decentralized ledger of ownership, which would be relatively, I guess, stateless in terms of governance and legislature, I imagine. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm bullshitting. But I'm a venture investor, so that's my job. Yep. Um, yep. Agreed. Uh, okay. When we think about that, I'm just fascinated. Like, would you like to solve that? Or is that like, no, like, I just think like that. And I'm sorry, I'm too intrigued. Like, you're an entrepreneur. It, it, it's possible in like my next thing, but I'm, I am so overwhelmed by my current job that it's hard to think about anything else. But I have thought of that. Like, for example, let me just try this out on you. Yeah. What if there were a fund that only in, that invested in companies where they cap their returns and excess returns trickle down to the rest of, 
everybody on the team. I mean, that sounds crazy because you're like, why would you cap your returns? Your whole job, your whole thing is to get maximum returns. Why do I not sign up for that fund? <laughs> yeah. I, I'll tell you what I did do. I'll tell you yeah. what I did do. When our Poker Stars investor, Isai, you know, the Scheinberg family, when they exited to GA, I said, I am going to block this transaction as hard as I can unless we set aside a huge percentage comparatively of the sale. Everybody is going to pay, I think it was 7% of their gains into a separate pool. This turned out to be tens of millions of dollars that we put into a separate pool and then we now pay out to the people who were here at the company who did not have ownership, but we now pay out to them over a period of time that they stay working with us. We call it a retention bonus, but it's as if they had equity. And we, we so we, we did not have to do this, but I forced tens of millions of dollars off of the gains of people who exited at that time to go into a special pool to reward the workers and the people who are here. And I'm going to do it again. GA, if you're listening, I'm going to do it again. Um, and it's important to me that that money trickles down to the people who are doing it. Can I be so rude, Eric? And forgive me, I really like you. I'm loving this. Do you ever worry? I, I worry sometimes that I'm too direct. I'm too confrontational. Like saying like, GA, I'm going to do it. Do you ever worry that they go, Hmm. Not so happy about that. I mean, no. they, they, they had plenty of time to get to know me before, before we did this. Um, you know, I think I, mean, no, no, I, I, I totally get it, but it, it leads to my, to my next question, which is, you know, you mentioned, um, the tumultuous nature, um, of, uh, life, uh, in some respects, I do want to touch on Russia. You know, you took the decision to speak up against Russia and I, I think it led to, uh, what you said, a call from the FBI about a contract to kill you posted on the dark web. Can yeah. you just take me to this? What happened? How did this go down? I was just standing at the whiteboard, like talking about something with a friend. And there was a call and uh, it was actually the local police station, which said, hey, have you talked to the FBI yet? And I was like, uh, no. And they said, oh, well, they reached out to us to let us know about you know, this death threat on the internet that someone had ponied up some money to have you killed. And the reasons were because of your stance on, you know, on Russia. Why did you decide to take the public stance? Many didn't. Um, it can be unnerving for safety. Um, why did you decide to do that? Uh, taking a stand is hard, but sometimes you got to do it. How do you draw the line on what stand to take? That's the hard thing of like Israel Gaza. Do you take a stand there? Do you take a stand on U.S. elections? Do you take a stand? It is all very hard. And I think, you know, we have not drawn very many, you know, we haven't taken a stand too many times. Why did you hear Russia invading Ukraine? We have a lot of team members in Ukraine. We have, we have a lot of team members in Russia uh, who have mostly left. It was it was very hard to see. And I, I feel like it's one of the great evils of, you know, the last few years is to see this direct assault. There are many other evils happening. And again, I'm, I, I understand the hypocrisy of taking a stand here, but not taking a stand there. But this is one of the most black and white issues out there. I would say Israel Gaza is not a black and white issue. Um, there are it's it's mostly just a black issue across all of all, all of it. Do you think politics has a place in the workforce? I think a lot of people who work for me think that it has a place in the workforce, um, the workplace. We try to thread this in in one way, which is to say we are not out there trying to have a stand on any particular issues. But our belief is that chess is for everyone, and that's an inclusive message. All people, all genders, all races, all religious affiliations, all everything. When you think about like moral stances to take, it's something that often parents instill on children. You have four children. Your eldest, I think, is 22. How old were you when you had your first, Eric? I had a pretty wild junior high. I'll just say that. I'm, I'm kidding. My wife hates that joke. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Oh, Lordy. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm in my uh, mid 40s here. I had my first kid at 23. Did you feel ready? Were you scared? I was scared, but I was ready. I, 
I think being 23 for me as a person at that age, all that I had done in my life, uh, honestly, you know, some people are like, oh, late to launch or whatever. I was like early. I was one, I was a very mature, early mature person doing laundry by myself when I was, you know, a very young age, shopping, grocery shopping for myself, starting companies. Like I just was, you know, I went and lived as a, was a Mormon missionary for two years in Argentina and washed my clothes, you know, the mud off my clothes in a bucket with my knuckles. And like, you know, I was just very young. I was put in positions of responsibility. So having a kid at 23 honestly felt like no big deal. What does great fatherhood mean to you? And how has your style of parenting changed over time? 23, now, you know, 45. Um, how's that changed in terms of what being a great father means? Yeah, I'm learning still every day what it means to be a great father because it's different a little bit for each kid. I really try to meet my kids where they are and see the best in them. I think that some kids are easier to parent with certain styles than others. Some kids are more compliant. Some are more willing to please. My older two kids were easiest in some ways. And my younger two who are still at home, I have different challenges and I'm learning there. But like, for, I'll give you an example for my 15 year old son. He's so incredibly bright. But he really doesn't love to have people tell him what to do. That includes, you know, but his sister's got, you know, he's, she drives out the, out the door at eight o'clock to go to school, but he doesn't want to be woken up. He doesn't want to be bothered. And so we finally said, hey, like, all right, we're not going to set an alarm for you. We're not going to, you know, take money from your bank account. If you're late, we're not going to do these things. Just good luck, man. Good luck. So if he misses school, he's got to Uber to school. He's got to figure it all out on his own. And that actually makes him happy rather than bumpers down the bowling lane. He wants maximum freedom with maximum consequences. All right. Do kids not need structure? No child wants an alarm clock. Of course they don't. No one wants to get up. Generally speaking, it's, it's human nature to be inherently less uh, alarm ready or whatever we want to call it like do you not need to do uh, educate me but do you not need to instill those guardrails some it works well it works well for some kids who understand that and there's a little bit of friction and you know you kind of help and over time they see and do those things and that is true for some personalities for other personalities sometimes the best thing is just to get out of the way and let life take its course. So I'm not trying to say either approach is best is very kid dependent, but the more I tried to structure for my son, the worse outcomes he had, it was counterintuitive because it worked with my other kids and didn't work for him. And so I had to change, you know, my wife and I had to change strategies there. If you could call yourself up, Eric, the night before you became a father, when you were 23, what would you tell yourself? You've got 22 years of wisdom now. And you can say, Eric, you should know this. What would you say? Oh, man, you're going to make me emotional here. I think be really attuned to that ratio of positive uh, versus negative. Um, when you're a kid, you, you, you feel the negativity from authority. You feel the wrong that you do. You feel when you mess up. You feel when you disappoint. You feel, you know, you feel it all so heavy. And there's so much of it. You're getting so much correction in life. You're getting so many negative moments and a lot of it's in the world. And if you're making your home also a place of negativity, you know, a lot of kids just want to check out because they can't handle the negativity. So just trying to make home as positive as possible and have the most positivity so that when there are those corrective moments, you have a lot in the bank. And I wish, you know, just you cannot do enough. There's, there's no too much. Just do more and more. Did you have negative too much negativity in that proportion i think there were times and periods or certain areas with each kid where you really want the best outcome for them in this thing and so as a parent you you fixate on it and you try to i want to fix this i want to control this i want to adjust this and it turns into a lot of negativity and you end up sometimes creating more problems than if you hadn't fixated on it and you had just left it be. And I can think for each of my kids, different moments or things where I was really trying to control or, you know, guardrail or convince or do that. 
and ended up in some ways causing more damage than if I had just kind of let, if I had let, shown more love and just kind of given them the time and space to get there rather than try to, you know, make it happen. Speaking of like making it happen, I, I interviewed Harley, um, you know, the president of Shopify, and he said that when it came to marriage, the most important thing is actually not to provide a solution. And it's actually to make the person feel heard, but not come in with, well, we can do this and this and this. When you think about lessons on what it takes to have a great marriage, what are some of your lessons there? The greatest thing you can do is validate and listen. And then when everybody feels validated and safe and heard and comfortable and like down to baseline and safe, then and only then can you have productive conversations around policy or decisions or different things. But most people get into escalating fights and arguments about trying to feel heard and validated. And if you can be the person in your relationship, when there's tension to just stop and say, I'm setting my issues aside and I'm going to listen to this person as a human and what their needs are and what's driving them and what their feelings are and listen and say, I hear you. That sounds hard. I understand. That makes sense. I feel that you help that person then feel safe as a person. And then hopefully they'll take the time and their turn to then listen to you and do the same for you. And then when you come together, then you can start possibly then or later to work on solutions to the problems. Cause there are, there can be real problems and just validating feelings doesn't solve problems, but you have to start there. Have you always shown the true full extent of yourself? If we're honest, I don't show the full extent of myself because if you knew what I was like, you would leave. <laughs> like, I guess that's human nature. Like, do you it's show It's not my full... nature, if I'm honest. So you show the darkest depths of yourself. I don't feel like a dark person. I feel like a needy person sometimes. I feel like a confused person. Do you feel the need to always be strong? People love like reality. People love vulnerability. Um, people love self-deprecation and humor and just like real. People love real. It's, just, it's always been who I am. I, I don't have the, I haven't had the drive to do that. And I think I had a safe home where I felt like I could be myself. And I grew up that way, feeling very self-assured and I've had friends and people who just love me for who I am. And I'm not a perfect person and I make a lot of mistakes. I have character flaws for sure, but I try to lead with, with, with humility and with like, you know, acceptance of who I am and who everybody is. And I've found that that's created really great relationships. If you ask Keith, Keith will probably tell you that, um, I work a lot, like a lot, a lot, seven hours, seven days a week, um, and far more than is healthy. And I don't have kids. I, cause I worry that I will be mediocre if I have anything else. What would you say to me? I think that make, I, I understand that. I think, um, I don't know if my dad's going to watch this, but I think my dad does that a little bit. I think he works to just not have to listen sometimes to some of the things that are maybe haunting in there. I have that at times too, for myself. Like I am a compulsive cleaner. Like I, like if you came to my house, you'd, you'd think the housekeepers were there, but I clean a lot because it puts me in a, in a, both in a zone of control, but also just act, like being busy just helps me. So I understand what you're saying, but I do think at some point to truly be happy, you have to be at peace with yourself as we started with. And work can cover up for that. I think that you could slowly start to work in a practice of real self, self acceptance and reflection that doesn't have to just be glossed over through, through work. And I say that as I'm also talking to myself as I say that. Do kids make you better at what you do? Like Marcello Claw from SoftBank said that actually post kids, he had a reason to fight. Like he had kids to feed, he had, you know, a family to build and other people are much more candid and say no they don't you, you if you're going to be a great parent it takes away from work but it fulfills you in other ways which side are you on i mean parenting is fulfilling for sure and does it mean that you can't be as good at your job do you have to make choices between those i would say some people probably do have to make choices but i will tell you that my situation and again, this is, goes back. I am home when my kids leave in the morning 
and I am home when they come home. And even that, that's partly working from home allows me to both put in a lot of work and hours over the week, but also be around and my kids can feel me there. I think people who have to do the grind to go out and they're traveling a ton or spend a lot of time in office. I do think that they may end up sacrificing some of their family six star or uh, whatever fulfillment the kids are like god i wish dad went to an office <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Don't worry. i'm sure i'm sure that's not the case and i totally get that dude i i so love this i want to do a quick fire so i say a short statement and you give me your immediate thoughts does that sound okay let's do it okay do you remember when you became a millionaire Yes. When was it? And can you take me to that moment? When I sold the second business and I had a I had a seven figure bank statement. I remember it. How old were you? Twenty eight. Did you feel happy? Yeah, I did. <laughs> there we go. Does money make you happy? I think achieving things makes me happy. I'm very achievement oriented and that makes me happy. And can money be a signal of that? It can. What have you changed your mind on in the last 12 months? I've changed my mind in the last 12 months um, a little bit around parenting, as I discussed earlier. I thought the guardrails were more important for everybody than they are. Huh. And I don't know that they are for everybody. And some some kids need need to just jump out of the nest, and that's okay. What scares you more than anything else? Dying, health, health-related issues. Not being able to exercise. Anything around physical un unwellness. Why does dying scare you? Oh, oh man. Weird. The future is so exciting. Don't you want to see it? Like the, I mean, society is evolving at such a crazy rate. It's like not being able to see the end of a movie. It's like, I just want to, I just want to see where it goes. No, I'm scared of dying because I'm worried about being forgotten in nothingness. I already, I'm, that, that's inevitable, man. Like, no, I'm not worried about that. But I understand <laughs> that. I understand. What's the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? My wife saw through that kind of asshole personality and forgave me many times early in our courtship and saw the good person that I was. Gave me a lot of grace to, to find that over time. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world for you know, an hour and a half and ask them anything, who would you have dinner with and what would you ask them? I don't know why that's such a hard question. Um, I, would have, I would have dinner with Bernard Arnault, you know, the founder of LVMH. Um, I'm just fascinated by how he thinks about brand, uh, social status tied to money and items. And I don't think anyone understands marketing like he does or fashion mm. or, or self-worth actually. He ties self-worth to very material things. Hmm. In an interesting way. I'll join you in that dinner. That does sound fascinating. What's your most controversial belief, penultimate one? Probably that nothing actually matters. And except for your relationships and time you spend with people that you love. 10 years time, final one. Where's chess.com then? This is 2034. Where's chess.com then? In some ways, I hope I don't know because I haven't thought about it in you know, a couple of years, just kidding. Um, I may be there in 10 years, may not. Uh, it's pretty stressful at times. So there's, there's times where I hope that uh, I don't think about it in, in 10 years, but I think chess will continue to be a big part of people's lives. And I think that in this world of exploding possibilities and a new, you know, there are dozens of game studios creating new games every single day to launch and do this and do that. And there's, we're in a world where there's more songs are being written and and more content is being created and more things are being done. People go back to the classics and for a little bit of just like safety. I mean, my, my kids listen to music from generations past because there's something that's like just classic about that. And I think that chess will be the fallback of the greatest strategy game and most interesting thing forever. And maybe even more so as there's even more proliferation of gaming you have some very misadjusted children if they're not listening to 20 vc but um <laughs> it's 
it's a very wise move to listen to some of the greats. Um, Eric, you know, I was told this would be a special one. You saw it before when we posted on LinkedIn. I've loved this. It re- shows like this are why I love doing what I do. So thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It was a joy to talk with you. I appreciate your questions and many of your pushbacks and your insights. Uh, it's been it's been great to dialogue. Thank you so much.